Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. Today we have a really special one talking about Elliot Kipchoge and how he broke two hours for the marathon. That was just incredible. I was actually uh, lucky enough to be there. I'm chatting with Andy Jones from Exeter University who was heavily involved in this project. He conducted a study to determine what was necessary to run two hours for a marathon. So looking at VO2 max, uh, lactate threshold, running economy, et cetera. In doing so, he was able to use that data along with other information to determine which runners should be involved in the sub two project, which was the first attempt at Monza. And then as we know, it was successful in Vienna in 2019 when he did run one hour, 59 and 40 seconds. So just amazing. So we discuss, as I said, VO2 max, lactate threshold, running economy, also the role of the shoes. And as you'll see, Andy knows Ali Kipchoge well. So he talks about some great anecdotes, et cetera. So stick around. Andy, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Glenn. All well, very well, thanks. Great. So um, it's, it's amazing. We, you know, we're going to talk about running. We're going to talk about Kipchoge and uh, you know, running under two hours and, and the study you did looking at you know, what does it take to run under two hours. But um, why don't you give us background on, on, your, on yourself? Like how did you get into research? Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, like a lot of people in sports science and physiology, as I've discovered, you know, I started off as an athlete, as a sort of teenager. I really got into sport and particularly middle and long distance running. I became, you know, it's one of those sports, thankfully, where the more work you do, the better you get, et cetera. So just always really enjoyed that. And I started to do a lot of reading because I was sort of self-coached. So really getting into the sports science, reading all the training theory books, all of that, um, trying to emulate some of my heroes. And then, you know, the natural progression for me was to study sports science because I was, you know, just lapping it up anyway so um, and the idea was that I'd use the sports science to propel my own running career but you know what it's like when you go to not everybody makes it just if they're a good junior and uh, got injured and ill and whatnot but the energy and the, the sort of passion that I had for for the running I kind of transferred to the science and just became obsessed with that really instead um, and I you know, in, in the same way that when you set records as a, as a runner, that's great because you kind of go in the record books. What I like about the science is when you publish a paper, it's kind of there forever. It's kind of scary as well. I never kind of read back my papers once they're published, but I um, still get excited about publish, publishing papers because that's like a historic thing that you kind of left. You know, even when you're dead, you know, those things could be read sort of thing. So that, that that's always exciting me. But then um, simultaneously, as well as doing the research and finding out new things, I've always liked to continue to work with runners. And I think when I'm designing a study, I'm always thinking about, well, how is this going to help somebody? I've always been interested in what are the limitations to performance? And of course you can get into the fundamentals of that, but you also need to think practically, what does this mean for an athlete and coach? How can they, how can this make them go faster? So I've had this kind of symbiotic thing going on where I go to, you know, things that I find out in the lab, I can hopefully translate to the, the field and the, the athletes that I work with you know you learn from them what the next big question is so that all that really works out and um and you mentioned Kipchoge you know but I started to be a consultant for UK Athletics in the first place and then Nike more recently and I've always really loved that opportunity to work with elite athletes so you know Paula Radcliffe I worked with for quite a long time who obviously became the women's world record holder and then when I got the chance to work with Nike on the Breaking 2 project that was just like manna from heaven really to combine all of the research that I've done over the last, however, you know, 20 or 30 years with my um, desire to apply that. I mean, you know, what, what a great opportunity to, and to sort of put that on this on this one uh, overarching goal, you know, because there, there'd been a big debate as, you know, is it even possible? There was a lot of scepticism when Mike Joyner and I were speculating about it. We, we both thought it was possible. Nike in the first place, then Ineos wanted to put some financial might behind it, but there were still sceptics. They all thought it was a bit of a, you know, just uh, um, that we'd all have egg on our face sort of thing. So, yeah, it was it was great that it actually came through. And there's no better person for it to happen to than than Elliot Kipchoge. Maybe we'll get into that. It's, it's just a, he's a fantastic character as well as an incredible athlete. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so so I mean, there's a lot of stuff there to unpack. But just you were saying as a junior. You, so what was your running? You know, what was your career? What was your distance? What... I, I start. You know. It, with when you start running obviously you you know do sports day at school and it's 400 and 800 and 1500 so I started more as a middle distance runner um I ran you know 348 for 1500 meters I ran 358 when I was 16 352 when I was 17 348 when I was 18 and I ran a four minutes five um, for the mile as well but I found that the longer the distances were the better I seemed to be so I started then doing 3ks won a few championships five and but I was good on the road 
um, more so than than cross country. So when I was sixteen, I was I was actually just turned seventeen, but it was in the year that I was sixteen. I ran thirty thirteen for ten k, which I believe is still a UK wow. record. Still, a and UK. Also, yeah, yeah, nineteen eighty seven and sixty six minutes for the half marathon um, when I was seventeen. So. So that, that actually still stands as well. So I'm you know, very proud of those times. I hope they oh, carry on. You should be. I'm, I'm proud of my 31 minute 10K. <laughs> there's, there's nothing like that. Yeah, that's fast. Um, that was a long time ago, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you could actually almost talk to Kipchoge then. I think you've earned the right to talk to him about running, <laughs> running times and whatever. So yeah, so as you said, um, working with Elliot Kipchoge, we'll talk about uh, Paula Radcliffe later. Um, you know, why don't we just just dis discuss a little bit? Because you know, some people say, "Oh, you know, that that's not that wasn't a, a proper a proper record anyway. That wasn't a proper marathon," which we know it wasn't. But um, you know, we have to keep in mind he's run in a proper marathon, two hours one and thirty nine seconds, which is the world record. So you know, to run under two hours is not a huge leap. I mean, it is a leap, but it's not like you know, it's. So why don't we just talk a little bit? Maybe you can explain a bit how about how why it's not considered a legit uh, marathon time now what what were the advantages he had yeah well there, there weren't many i mean one was that there was a rotating team of pacemakers so i think for a legitimate marathon you you know the same people would need to basically start and then if they drop out that's it you know so so that was the one thing the other thing was that typically well there's nothing in the rule books to say people can't be fed more frequently than every 5k but typically in major marathons you get a feeding station every 5k um but because it wasn't illegal, we fed them a bit more frequently than that if they required it. Or, you know, that we could have a more bespoke um, nutritional sort of program alongside that. And also they're supposed to collect their own drink from the table, whereas they were being handed it to them. But other than that, there wasn't much in it. And, you know, the thing that sort of inspired this to begin with is that the trouble for the marathon runners is that unlike it, let's say you're a 100 meter sprinter or even a 1500 meter runner, you get multiple opportunities in a season to run a really fast time you know because you can run lots of races and uh, there's a greater greater chance that a greater probability that you know on a given day you're going to get perfect conditions you know perfect temperature low wind um the right competition you feel great on that day you're in your peak neck and whatever for the marathon runners you don't get that you can probably only run one or two marathons you know per year and the chances of having perfect conditions therefore are really slight plus the courses that these great marathons uh, that the great the big city marathons are on aren't necessarily designed to be as fast so everything that you ever see in um even berlin but london chicago boston whatever they're not as fast as the athletes are capable of running and so this was really a case of giving the athletes the best conditions like the sprinters enjoy and say just how fast can you run if we optimize things for you and the other thing that you get of course is that you, because you have all of these multiple marathons um all the different athletes can choose choose whichever they like and you don't get all of the best people in the same race at the same time unless it's the olympics or the world championships when in most cases the course is terrible yeah. it's really hot yeah really humid nice. whatever so and that's about winning the gold medal it's not about running the fastest possible time so i think what happened in monza and and in vienna is not that unrealistic actually because if you could get all of the best runners you know, in the same race at the same time, um, motivated to run as quickly as they could rather than to finish first, you wouldn't be far off the sorts of times that we saw actually delivered. Okay, that makes sense. So, you know, so with the pacemakers, you know, they could, they could come in and out, they can't run more than, they, they just did like eight kilometers at a time. But you were saying you don't think that the pacemaking was itself was making a huge difference or? Yeah, well, what, what I was getting at there is, let's say you had all the best marathon runners in the world and the, and you sort of incentivize them to run at sub two hour pace for as long as they possibly could. You'd end up in a situation where, where the best athlete, let's say it's Kipchoge in this instance, is actually surrounded by a pack of runners who are all going at that same speed. Now, obviously, they're going to gradually drop off and off. But you could end up in a situation where, you know, with maybe 22, 23 miles, you've still got a little group there. Um, and it might be that the person who wins, who actually is capable of the sub two, is only on their own for a short distance. Now, when, when Kipchoge ran his um, 201.39 in Berlin, he was on his own for probably the last half of that, as far as I remember. You know, So he really was exposed to the elements. He wasn't able to draft. But if you if you had, um, you know, the uh, Bekele and others who, who, I mean, Bekele ran only a second or so slower than that. 
sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if he'd been in the same race and you had a bunch of their teammates, because you have pacemakers, you know, but they typically don't go they can't beyond. Can't keep up with him. That's the thing. No. Yeah, they they yeah. can't keep up with him. So that's why I think in Berlin, is like you said, I think they only made it to halfway or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm a bit of a fanboy. I, I, you were at Monza and obviously heavily involved, but, but you weren't at, at Vienna. I was actually at Vienna, luckily enough, because um, I was doing a sabbatical in, in Copenhagen. So I just like flip, got a cheap flight, flew over there. That was just amazing. So um, yeah. part of me, I guess, wants to be a bit of a fanboy and ask you, you know, what's, what's, what's it like just hanging out with Kipchoge? And uh, you know, he seems like a, like a gentle sort of soul. And, you know. Yeah, he's, he's great. Um... I mean, I'd, I'd gone to Kenya quite a few times with um, with the British athletics team, not as an athlete, but as a as a physiologist. So when I was consultant physiologist to UK athletics, we used to have altitude training sojourns, you know, over to um, to I ten. So I'm kind of familiar with going going to Kenya. But we had the chance with Nike. So after after we'd done the initial testing and we'd selected the athletes that we thought were capable of attempting this uh, amazing feat we went to visit them in their home environments so there was a chance to spend a bit of time with Elliot and his colleagues uh, you know Patrick Sang is the coach at, in Kiplagat and then we went to Ethiopia as well and uh, we didn't go to Eritrea um, because at that time the uh, that particular athlete was training in Spain but you know we we got into their camps and spent time with them and it wasn't a case of parachuting in and you know saying do that we didn't kind of control things these athletes were already the best in the world but it was an opportunity just to share experiences and knowledge and for us to learn what makes those guys so good and for sure you know in that um in the Kipchoge camp in Kiplagat it was just really special there was just something magical about it there was this belief there was this um serenity and, and Elliot just right yeah he just exudes peace and you know he's, he's just an amazing um, character i've kept in touch with him quite a bit he's kind of on whatsapp with me and things like mm-hmm. that and we had him over um to exeter not so long ago uh, gave him an honorary doctorate as well and he was very gracious about that so that was it's just really cool to hang out with him he's um he's full of wisdom uh, you, know, you know how you said about the environment part of me wonders uh you know in kenya in particular but maybe also in ethiopia and other places how much of it is like a mindset because, you know, their uncle, their, their cousin or whatever has been a world, you know, uh, level runner. You know, if, you, if you're brought up and it's not kind of unusual to have like, you know, someone who's so fast and, and then you've got them all to train with him. Now, obviously, they've got altitude and, and, you know, genetics and whatever else. But how much do you think of it? It's just sort of a mindset even. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's so much a mindset. It's certainly um, sort of... Um, there's the sociology of it you know the, the schools that they go to spawned world champions and world record holders in the past so if they've got a bit of talent and what they see of course is I mean the place isn't rich you know and, and they see people go off and they they make their fortune and they come back and they build hotels and hospitals or whatever and and they become famous and that is a path out of poverty for some of them and if they've got the talent it's like well, this is actually something that I could pursue and some of them do it for that reason i mean with people like elliot it's just for the joy of running as well i mean it's not a profession necessarily they you know there's no question that elliot would would probably run every day of his life anyway you know it's just that he's blessed with an incredible talent and a lot of his uh the people around him have that um have that same blessing as well um yeah th- there's an element of that and of course they run it, it's just the culture of there is to run there aren't you don't see too many bikes you don't necessarily see too many cars at least not newer ones so the way the modus operandi for for traveling you know there's this thing that people run x number of miles to and from school and they do you, you see kids running barefoot all of the time and they are inspired because you you know i've been on a truck you know tracking the, the runners as they do various distance um, runs and the school kids as as these elite athletes go by just try and join in you know they they're in their school uniform and they've yeah. got their satchel but they're running along as fast as they can trying to keep up and they're waving and smiling and you know so for sure that's part of the culture there and there's no question that it inspires the people that have got the talent to, to follow that course great right well i think enough of the fanboy for me let's start talking about the physiology so <clears throat> you had that paper that nice paper in uh, journal of applied physiology where you got a bunch of these guys uh this is this is before the monza attempt is that right where you had this yeah. Yeah, the 16 world-class marathoners looked at their, you know, what does it take to run at that pace? Did you want to just talk us through that a little bit? Um, you know, the, obviously you looked at VO2 max and lactate threshold and lactate turning point and running economy. And if we start to sort of pick it, pick apart, and what does it actually take to run at that pace? 
Yeah, I mean, probably the best place to start is with with Mike Joyner's, you know, model, the, the holy trinity of VO2 max, lactate threshold, as he called it, but really the fraction of your VO2 max that you can sustain in a steady state for a given duration of, or distance <clears throat> and the running economy. And, you know, what becomes obvious um, when you start to unpick that equation is that you can you can run sub two in a variety of different ways. You can have a really high VO2 max, maybe not such a good, economy, you know, the there are different permutations of those three variables that can make um, a 159 marathon possible. So um, ideally, you'd, you'd want them to be really high on all three numbers, you know, all very good performances on all three. And it isn't, isn't always feasible, it isn't always necessary. So one of the things we wanted to do was have them in the lab, measure those things, you know, put it into the joiner equation and do a prediction. What are you actually capable of? And there's a caveat to that that I might come back to. But in addition to doing the stuff on the treadmill, we also wanted to take them into the field, you know, run them around a track and at two hour marathon race pace and go, how comfortable are you? You know, does this, does it look feasible? And actually you're going to be able to sustain this for long, long periods. So we we asked them to run for two miles, really, um, you know, eight laps of the track and, and one very fast lap at the end, just to show they had a lot more gears that running at, um, 21.1 kilometers per hour was was comfortable for them so it was that all of that stuff in combination but I mean what we wanted to do was was screen a lot of the best athletes that were available um, uh, when we were thinking about this project and select those that had the best chance and we could have selected one we could have chosen three we could have gone six whatever we ended up landing on three and it was a case of looking at the physiology both on the you know when they, when they came to the the lab either in Exeter or in um, Portland Oregon where Nike are based uh, but we also looked at their track record you know what how successful have they been at the marathon in the past what's their trajectory have they run too many and are they on the kind of slippery slope down do they have a lot more potential um, when they run fast times what were the conditions when they did that we also modeled something called critical speed so if you look at their best times for say 1500 3k 5k maybe 10k you can predict, you can calculate their, their critical speed. Now, you, it's a bit like the maximal steady state. You can't run above your critical speed for the marathon distance. You're going to be just below it. So you need to have a critical speed that's much higher than 21.1. So that was another criterion. And, and then finally, actually, we wanted the athletes that we tested when we told them what this was all about to be really excited about the prospect of it, you know, them being the person to do it. We didn't want them going, well, hmm, yeah, I don't think it's possible or how much will I be paid? It was like, this is just the, you know, the historic opportunity to be the, the, the Neil Armstrong, the, the Roger Bannister, whatever. So, it was, and they needed the right coaching. In for, it, was, it was a whole bunch of stuff that came into the decision making. Oh, sorry, can I just interject? Uh, I didn't pick that up. So, you, so you had 16 of these world class marathoners with, you know, uh, I think you had a half marathon of like 59 something and a marathon of 205. So incredible bunch. But are you mm. saying you actually use that testing to decide who was going to run uh, for in Monza to try and break two hours? It wasn't, you didn't pre-select that. You used that testing to work that out, did you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but it was, awesome. what I'm saying is that wasn't the only factor, but it was a, a major factor for sure. Okay. Now, the other the thing that you have to bear in mind, though, and that's the reason why we didn't use the testing alone, is that when we had the opportunity to test the athletes, they weren't necessarily in their best condition. <clears throat> we had a couple of windows of opportunity to test the athletes when we could fly them in from, sure. from Africa, either to the UK or to the US. And, you know, some of them were in good nick. Others had run a marathon not so long ago and were recovering. Some were rebuilding, you know. So we had to take some of the data with a bit of a pinch of salt. I mean, that said, they never get truly unfit. You know, they weren't overweight or anything like that. They were in they were in training, but they weren't necessarily in their peak condition. So we had to bear that in mind to some degree as well. I guess I figured that because, um, yeah, only, you said only seven out of 16 could run the actual 21.1K uh, an hour, but they'd all had an average... Um, half marathon quicker than that so they must some of them must have been slightly outside which is as you say i mean it's hard yeah. enough doing I mean, a study with just well-trained you know triathletes so you're trying to get the world-class best people in at the, at the exact time and at the exact time they wouldn't want to do it anyway because they run a race right so yeah you're not going to be you can't be in your best condition all, all year round right so um but i mean what it shows you though is that even in that you know your 16 best runners in the world more or less and um, at, at any one particular time, only about half of them can run at that speed. It just shows you what an incredible feat it is, because it's not that they can't run faster. It's just that actually running at 21.1 1 
is completely steady state and it's quite comfortable. <laughs> you know, there aren't many people capable of that, even amongst that elite group. That's that's the important uh, point. So totally. absolutely, the, th the three that we selected were amongst the seven who actually showed us that running at 21.1 wasn't so difficult. <laughs> it, it totally freaks me out because, I mean, just for, for people that, that don't know the numbers, because I kind of crunched the numbers and you had it in your paper as well, but you know, we're talking about two minutes 50. Well, sorry, when Elliot ran 159.40, that's two minutes 50 per K and yeah. four minutes 34 per mile, which is just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you know, you were better than I was, but when I was you know, a 31 minute 10 K runner, I'd do my three kilometer, I'd do my one K repeats in three minutes and then have a rest yeah. and then do another one. Now they're doing the whole thing in 250. It's just, yeah. it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Right, so another thing that gets talked about a lot, obviously is the shoes there. Yeah? So the, the, the Nike, Alpha flies or whatever they they keep, um, you know, being updated and they're quite incredible. I saw a picture actually. Ali Kipchoge put one on uh, Twitter the other day that seemed even weirder, but um, you know, amazing shoes. But uh, what, what percent is what difference does that make? So they, I think they're saying about four percent. Is it so four percent less oxygen at the same speed? Is that right? As you say, there have been various iterations of of the super shoe. It started with the vapor fly, and that was actually launched in in Monza. Um, and both Nike's testing and independent testing by Roger Cram indicated that if you know if, you, if you're running at a particular speed on the treadmill, let's say, or over ground, um, and you wear the, the, this vapor fly compared to a regular shoe, the oxygen cost of running at that speed is four percent less. So, in other words, you become more economical. So, you know, that's important. That's only one of those components. It doesn't change your VO2 max. It doesn't, but actually changing your economy is not not straightforward to do it takes a you know you can't actually change your cycling efficiency really at all and no matter how hard you train with running your your economy does improve over time you just have to recruit the miles over long long periods but it's it's hard work so to have something that's acute like that you just put on some shoes and you know five seconds later you've got a four percent less oxygen cost is a big deal so for sure and then what they've done is that they then became the one percent uh sorry the next percent so it was vapor fly then the next percent, and now it's the Alpha Fly. And the Alpha Fly has even more uh, cushioning, basically. It's got more of the magic foam. So it's got a carbon plate in it, but it's got foam as well. And what's the, you know, when you run people over short distances again, or for short durations, the change in the energy cost and oxygen cost is pretty similar. Um, but when you, I mean, I, I suspect, and this needs to be investigated further, it's, it's so well cushioned. And we did a study on this looking at muscle damage. You know, I don't know if you've ever run a marathon. I've only done a couple in recent years, but your legs just get battered. You know, by the, you get it to 20 miles and it's, you're not, you are submaximal. You're not breathing hard. Your heart rate's not very hard, but so it's all peripheral. You're running out of glycogen and you're just, your legs have been battered time, you know, so many thousands of foot strikes. And I just think that level of cushioning probably means that you stay fresher for longer. So the, the fatigue that you accrue as a consequence of that, damage for want of a better phrase is probably not there so i suspect that it might only be you know four percent it's not not an insignificant amount um you know in the first mile but it might be worth at least that in the last mile because you just because what we know is and this is what i wanted to get to that fourth dimension so we mentioned vo2 max lactate threshold running economy um but none of those things are static they're all dynamic things you know we this kind of assumption is that the values that you have on the start line remain the same but but they don't you know as you fatigue as you change your substrate metabolism um you start to use more fat less carbohydrate you, you your oxygen cost drifts the, the the amount of oxygen it costs you to transport your body mass one kilometer in the final kilometer of the of the marathon is going to be higher than it was at the beginning so the other thing that we need to take into account, and this is very difficult to measure presently in the lab, is the extent to which these things change over time. And I suspect that people like Paula Radcliffe and Elliot Kipchoge are particularly good in that fourth dimension, if, if you want to call it that. You know, they're, they're just more fatigue resistant, they're more resilient, whatever phrase you want to use. And I think the shoe plays into that. I think the sh this, particularly the Alpha Fly, probably ena enables people to not lose their efficiency, their economy as the race progresses. And if you, you only have to look at the way Elliot Kipchoge finished in Vienna. Oh my gosh! You know, to to, to know that he didn't oh, seem to be. I his was going to say that. So I was, was actually, you know, I was there obviously. So I saw him come past. I think it was eight times. That was the, it was such an amazing course because they just kept going up and down the Prada, I think it's called, and it was totally flat. So you saw eight times, and I just kept. He just didn't look like he was tiring. 
He looked the yeah. same. And I know on the cat on the TV they said, "Oh, he's starting to do his little smile, which means he's hurting or something." But um, I, I, I felt like he could have gone harder. <laughs> I, I don't know. It just looked like it. Well, I, I spoke to him in um, so when he came over and got his honorary doctorate with us, we had you know lunch with him and just asked. Well, actually, it was our vice chancellor who <laughs> who said to him, "How how hard was it to run one fifty nine?" He said it wasn't hard. <gasps> Oh my gosh. So just how fast he could have gone that day is anyone's guess. But you could see he was as fresh as a daisy, wasn't he, at the end of that race? Oh, yeah. So I saw them the day before they were like practicing and, and they had had the spot where they decided they were going to let the pacemakers uh, let him go, you know. And and if you actually watch it, there's a, a video with him running straight towards it. It looks like he's just chanting at the bit and they're waiting for them. No, let me go, let me go, you know. And he didn't actually have much time to make up because he was basically running at the speed they'd set it at. And then he didn't have much time to then like cut loose. You know? mm. So that really gave you the feeling he'd go faster. So you've mentioned Pauline Radcliffe a few times, and I guess we haven't tried to quantify how much faster you think it is running in those conditions. But, you know, the fact that Pauline Radcliffe ran, you know, in a, in a city race, you know, which wouldn't be perfect, you know, conditions and, and flat and whatever. She ran two hours 15. I know she's not the world record holder anymore, but just, um, you know, what sort of time, you know, it's a guess, I'm sure, but. Yeah, um, well, I mean, if you if you think about what happened with Kipchoge, so before Monza, his personal best was 203.05, I think, or 202.50, yeah, 203.05. So basically he went two and a half minutes faster in Monza. Um, and obviously then he, he got the world record in Berlin and then he went faster again in Vienna, you know. So it was a bit of a bit of a journey. But if we take that first two and a half minutes, you could say, well, what, what were the interventions? So a variety of interventions that we put in place. And then you have to try and quantify, you know, what proportion of that two and a half minutes came from those different things. So the shoe is obviously one element. Now, just because your running economy is 4% uh, better, doesn't mean you go 4% faster necessarily. So there's, but there's a fraction there. It could be as much as a minute. Um, the pacing was, so there's pacing and drafting actually. And you could think of those two things as separately or combined. Um, we certainly made sure that we went for as an e even as pace as possible. We didn't want him to have to run a major negative split. You want to kind of give the confidence. So we went through halfway in just under the hour. Um, and you could argue, you know, you, you don't want to go too much faster and see them fade and, you know, struggle. But on the other hand, what we saw in Berlin was that actually ran a substantial negative split. So, you know, maybe it would have been better to do 60-20 and then, you know, come in faster. But anyway, we went for an even pace strategy, which I think was sensible. The drafting, there was a nice paper by Griffith Pugh from the Journal of Physiology in the 70s, was it? I can't remember that. Um, but, you know, the, the actual energy sparing that you get when you draft people is quite substantial. It's nothing like you get when you're running, going at really high speeds in cycling, but it's not, in, you know, it's not, um, not to be sniffed at kind of thing. So having him, having the opportunity for him to run behind a wall of other people, that absolutely reduces the oxygen cost again, which means that you can run at a faster speed for the same effort. That's got to be worth a substantial, you know, I did do the sums at one time, that's possibly up to a minute's worth as well. Then you've got the nutrition thing, just making sure that they were given the right things at the right times. And they don't always get that chance. First of all, the one thing, I mean, not, not Kipchoge, but a lot of the African athletes really weren't well informed about the importance of fluid and carbohydrate intake during a marathon. So it was a big educational thing about that. And it takes a while to kind of, and you have to train with it. A lot of these athletes, I think really including Elliot, would, yeah, he actually understood that it was necessary to take carbohydrate during a race. But it didn't mean that he practiced. So during the long runs, they typically just get up early, no breakfast, and they go and run there. 20, 25 miler, and they don't drink en route. But, and it's all very well, and that, you can argue that that gives you some sort of metabolic adaptation, but actually the physical act of practicing, of picking up a drinks bottle, of getting used to having fluid in, the, all of that needed to be practiced. And we made some good inroads on that prior to Monza, but it still wasn't perfect. And when we picked up the drinks bottles post-race, they hadn't consumed quite as much as we'd hoped. But nevertheless, we were still getting more carbohydrate into them than they were used to. Um, and that will have some effect as well. And, uh, it, it becomes a bit of a sort of mosaic then, how, how much of it was this, 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 and this. But in combination, um, you end up with about two and a half minutes. If you apply the same sort of thing to Paula, I mean, she ran that London Marathon while she ran 215.25, more or less completely solo. 
Um, she ran a bit of a negative split there as well. She wasn't drafted, therefore. She did, you know, her nutrition was pretty good. I don't think she missed any new, um, any any bottles. Um, I can't. The conditions in London that day weren't too bad. I mean, that's the other thing to, to re you know, remember. We chose Monza at that time of the year because we expected the conditions to be really conducive, and they were. And the same was true for Vienna. You need a nice, cool temperature, still, flat, nice road surface. We gave them all those opportunities. Um, Paula didn't have the super shoe, so you know you could certainly imagine that that she. But what she did have was a brilliant day. She just felt great that day. You know, it was almost like a runner's high on race day. But yeah, I mean, two to three minutes. So she could potentially run 212 something and would absolutely still be the world record holder today. I know that, I mean, she kept getting faster and faster. She ran 218 on a debut and then 217 and then 215. There was an occasion um, sometime after she ran the 215 where at least in training, she was even fitter than when she ran the 215. So yeah, I think at least 213. Maybe okay. two twelve. It's funny. I, I had to laugh a bit. <laughs> there when you, I had to smile a bit. Two twelve. No, I, I'm going to go two twelve. From what you said, right. I'm going to go. Let's give it two twelve. But to, when you said she had a good day and she felt good, it, it was a bit hard to tell when she was feeling good. She always looked like she was hurting every step of the way. Right? Yeah. It was just agony to watch her run. Actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So I just realised we kind of glossed over a bit the, the findings of your study. So looking at VO two max, running economy, lactate threshold, etc. Did you want to just give us a bit of an idea of, you know, what correlated, what didn't correlate and, you know, whatever. I, I know that separate things didn't correlate, but when you combine some, so maybe just give it a bit of a. Yeah, yeah. So that's absolutely right. So when you look at VO2 max alone or, or any of the lactate variables alone or running economy alone, there was no relationship between that and their personal best time for the marathon. It's only when you put it in into the joiner equation. And basically what that is, is, is what's your sustainable fraction? Of, what's your what's the VO2 you can sustain in the steady state divided by the running economy? So, so actually you've got all three of the variables in that same equation. And um, it's only when you put all of those numbers in. And actually, even though this was a homogenous cohort, at least in terms of performance, there was quite very quite a large inter-individual variability for, for VO2 max, for lactate related variables and for the running economy. Um, and so what it means is that, you know, the, the people were able to run their, their fast marathons in a variety of different ways or with a different combination of physiological attributes. So yes, yeah, only when you put it all together, the, the thing that was quite interesting, we took the opportunity to measure their VO2 kinetics. So um, during the treadmill test as well. So essentially what we did was rather than you know, ramp up the, the speed to the that first stage rapidly. We just, we warmed them up, but we just dropped them onto the treadmill at that speed. And then you obviously have got to meet that energy demand as rapidly as possible. So you track VO2 on a breath by breath basis and you can calculate the time it takes to reach a steady state. And what was quite interesting is it was the one, if there was a single variable that correlated, it was their time constant, how rapidly their VO2 rose to achieve that steady state when, when there was this step change in running speed. Um, and, and you can, there's other studies which show that, you know, and that probably reflects muscle oxidative capacity to some extent. It's a, an integrated oxygen transport variable, but it's a lot of it is to do with um, mitochondrial volume and uh, oxidative um, metabolism. And there have been studies which show that that correlates really well with the critical speed, which I spoke a bit about as well. You know, people who've got faster, faster VO2 kinetics have higher critical speeds, which absolutely is necessary here because we did uh, did just like a little study where you you extract people's best personal you know, best personal best times for different distances you calculate what their critical speed is and then you can calculate what fraction of their critical speed they operate at during their best marathon and it's it's like 96 percent and it's really quite consistent so it's like the athletes know where that critical speed is they know they can't go above that because the moment they do you know, all bets are off, their muscle phosphocreatin is going to fall, their pH will fall, their VO2 is rising much more rapidly, they use glycogen at a greater rate, etc. So intuitively, they know they can't go above that, I operate just below it. Now, interestingly, if you, if you do a lactate profile, you know, so what we do is three minute stages, um, say, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19 kilometers per hour, measure blood lactate concentration, you measure heart rate and oxygen uptake at the same point in time. And you see basically, you know, two break points, um, you've got the lactate threshold where it first starts to drift, dribble up above, above the rest in baseline of around one or so millimolar. But then you get the second one where it kind of really accelerates away 
I mean, it's a bit noisy, especially determining that second one isn't always straightforward. But if you get clean data, you can see this sort of three phase transition. And it's that we call it lactate threshold and lactate turn point. You've got the moderate domain below the lactate threshold. You've got the heavy domain between the lactate threshold and the lactate turn point. Then you've got the severe domain. And that lactate turn point kind of coincides with the critical speed quite well. Um, so when we looked at what correlates with performance, we looked at lactate threshold, we looked at lactate turn point, and we took a 96% of the lactate turn point, which is you know, assuming the lactate turn point is the same as the critical speed. And then you start to really um, get close to what they are actually capable of. So, um, yeah. Okay, wow. Okay, so one, one thing that I picked up in your paper and also a guy, Jeff uh, Rothschild from New Zealand, uh, sent a Twitter, Twitter question that he wanted me to ask you which was this uh, concept that I wasn't aware of, that the people that have a high VO2 max, and you found this in your paper as well, they tend to be actually less economical. Um, and that, that just uh, does my head in, to be honest. I'm <laughs> just wondering if you can, because I mean, obviously, as you touched on, if you can have a high VO2 max, be econo high, you know, economy, and also be able to run at a high percent of your max, you just clean up. But um, do you have any idea what's going on there? Because that's... Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly it's the holy grail, and and what you what you want is a combination. I mean, certainly if you've got a low VO2 max, you can compensate by having excellent running economy, but vice versa. And, and that, yeah, we we did see that relationship, and I've seen it before as well. Um, there are some people who think it's just a spurious relationship, um, but the if you the, the the explanation for it is potentially that it's to do with muscle mass and its distribution. <clears throat> So if what you find with the people who are really economical, actually, is that they have pretty skinny legs, very skinny um, calves, very long Achilles tendons, but they're not carrying, and, and there's this, you know, the pendulum thing, I'm no biomechanist, but I know that if you carry a big weight on your foot, that costs you a lot of, a lot of energy, right? Um, a lot of oxygen. So I think the people who are most economical don't have a lot of muscle, but they're, they're all tendon, really, um, for want of a better phrase. They also, by the way, the Kenyans have really muscular feet. I learned, oh. and uh, some physios who work. So, and they work. They run over some really tough terrain. They do a lot of walking around barefoot, and they've got you know bodybuilders feet. Anyway, that may be for another occasion. Um, but if you if you haven't got much muscle, and obviously when it's maximal oxygen uptake, it, it's you, you want to be consuming a lot of oxygen, and the thing that consumes all the oxygen is the muscle. So there's this, you know, I think if you've got more muscle you potentially can achieve a higher VOT max, but at the expense oh, of worse okay. economy, because all of a sudden they're carrying more muscle on your legs um, oh. where, it, where the options being. So I think that's probably the best explanation for that relationship. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I've, de I've definitely noticed with the, the Kenyan uh, distance runners, their calves, they're, they're, you could put your hand around there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, that's and they've got, quite, they've got sort of quite a long shank and that what calf muscle they have is quite sort of up close to the knee sort of thing. There's, there's quite, it's quite slender. And then they got a tiny bit of muscle. Up. Yeah, so like you um, say, it's like a long leap. If you have a long lever, you know, it takes more energy. So they've got like a, well, not the long, they've got the long lever, but something heavy at the end of the lever. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. When we, when we measure running economy in the lab, as I mentioned, you know, we do it in a fresh state. We bring, we want them to be fresh. We bring them in, we, and we measure them in the steady, you know, all of that. But it's actually a bit unrealistic because they're not fresh in a race for very long. And I think there's a lot to be said for actually determining running economy when they're fatigued, you know, when they've had a hard day the day before, or, you know, after an hour of running, you bring them back to the lab and you measure their economy again. So I suspect that if the Kenyans have an advantage when it comes to running economy, it's late in a race rather than early in a race. And my observations are, you know, when you go to Kenya or Ethiopia and you watch them train, they, tr they train really, really hard, but yet their biomechanics their form doesn't seem to deteriorate they seem to be just as economical you know they don't express fatigue in quite the same way as the british athletes that i took to kenya do you can see you, you just have to be sitting up in the stand watch them do a session and go they're really really tired and the kenyans are working just as hard and they don't look as tired so there's something about it. they're able to maintain their form and presumably preserve their running economy to a much better extent and that's a whole mystery which i think as physiologists is is um, is ripe for us to try to work out okay yeah so we've talked about economy a fair bit but um just one more thing it was something that andy coggan sent through to me and it, it triggered my uh, memory that um you know you both you him and also i have done some some research with nitrates and beetroot juice and things like that 
Um, Andy was saying that he, you know, he'd heard that Kipchoge, uh, Elliot Kipchoge, drinks uh, beetroot juice. But would you expect that to have any real effect on him? Because it appears, you know, from what I've read, that um, nitrate tends to reduce oxygen costs during exercise more in untrained than trained. Is that, is that a fair point? Yeah, I think, you know, the meta-analyses that have been done on that and the individual studies as well with um, individuals whose VO2 max is higher than about 65 mils per kilogram per minute, uh, yeah, the, the effects are negligible. I mean, what we do see with athletes or, you know, people of all fitnesses is that there's quite a bit of variability in the response to nitrate supplementation. So, um, first of all, the extent to which plasma nitrate and nitrite in particular are elevated can be quite different you know, even if you give people the same dose, but also the bioavailability, um, sorry, the bio, but also the bioactivity, you know, so in some people you get the elevation of plasma nitrite and yet you don't see much difference in blood pressure or economy or performance. And in others you do. So it's quite a noisy sort of a thing. I mean, on, on average, you know, if you look at um, Jack Sanofel's meta-analysis in MSSE, it, for, for a lot of activities, and for most people up to about 65 mils per kilogram per minute, there's, there's likely to be some effect despite the inter-individual variability that we see. It certainly is true that elite athletes um, tend to respond much less, but there are, you know, I'm a member of various Facebook groups with um, with elite athletes who actually, you know, it's all anecdote and all of that, and it could be a placebo effect, but they believe that there's something about it that makes them, they feel easier, it helps them, they enjoy it. I don't know, I mean, Kip, certainly when I was appointed to the Nike team, uh, one of the things that I thought we might wish to try, and this was this was a lot longer ago before we learned that elite athletes might not benefit to the same extent. It's like, well, why don't we, you know, it's one of the things that we could try um, with, with him might be nitrate. And uh, to my surprise, he'd been using it for several years already. So, oh. <laughs> and it, before all of his big races and certainly is a big fan and a big believer so you certainly don't want to kind of um oh, no, you rip that away from them in that case <laughs> I think you know. whatever he's doing it seems to be working yeah and it's not do it's not going to do them any harm there's no evidence that no. it makes elite athletes worse so you know no. as much as anything else it's a it's a supplement that has probably plenty of uh, good things in it exactly right um all right so another thing i can't help thinking about and you touched on it is, is their training you know the the kenyans training and i, I remember years and years ago there was a paper I think it was Myberg. Uh, I can't remember Catherine Myberg or something from South Africa. She looked at she looked at South African runners of similar abilities, the, and then looked at the, the the black runners and the and the and the white runners, and uh, found that they tend the, the black runners tended to run uh, even at the same distance. They do a higher quality, uh, you know, like higher intensity. Do you find that like do you know the breakdown of you know there's the eighty twenty sort of polarized training and things like this. Do you find that they train harder than, than you know, than... Do you think, how much of it do you think is training? You know, you also think about the fact they live at altitude and all these other factors, you know, how much do you think is... Yeah, I, well, I mean, there's two, two questions in there, isn't there? I mean, um, certainly the altitude uh, isn't going to do them any harm, is it? You know, they're just so used to running in a low oxygen environment that when you come down to sea level for those big races it, you probably feel supercharged you know you're almost in a hyperoxic condition so that can't be bad in terms of the training i think there's a lot of misreading of what they do there's because he will occasionally run really easy so in the evenings you know they, they train pretty hard in the mornings and in the evenings they'll do a sometimes up to 10k but quite slow it's almost just a kind of social amble kind of thing um but then you read these headlines like, oh, you know, train slow to run fast. And it's totally misleading because um, mostly they do run hard. And, and I wouldn't describe what they do as polarized either. They, you know, when you're running 120 miles a week or 180 kilometers per week, that's a fair bit of distance. So and they're, they're full time athletes. So they have the opportunity to do a high volume. And fair enough. Now, when you're running a high volume, you have to dial down the intensity don't you so you can, but you've got to get the right balance so naturally the majority of what you do will be easy to steady but then you get some tempo and some intervals now when, when they run their intervals they tend to make them quite extensive so it might be something like 10 by a mile or 15 by a kilometer or 30 times one minute on off that kind of stuff so that tends to be at around 10k pace but when they run steady now the, the first mile it serves as a warm-up they, they trundle off at you know nine minute mile pace 
but it's not long before it really starts to ramp up. And I think one of the key things that they do in in their weekly training, they do, you know, most runners do their long run on a Sunday morning. In Kenya, they do it or Elliot's camp on a Thursday, for whatever reason. And um, they do anything between thirty and forty kilometers. And sometimes when they run the 40 kilometers, they run them pretty damn hard. Now, remember in that, or fast at least, remember that it's an altitude, it's hilly, the terrain is bumpy as hell, and they start slowly. They still sometimes run that 25 miles in about two hours 15. Um, and what happens is it, it, start, it starts slow, and they just go through the gears. First mile's easy, gets, and it just gets gradually faster and faster. They start with a group of about 100, and it just thins and thins and thins until you've just got, you know, um, Jeffrey Kamaror and Elliot Kipchoge left at the end sort of thing but they go right you know they go into the tempo zone they go into sort of marathon effort even if it's not quite marathon pace and finish probably faster still so that sort of progressive long run is absolutely crucial um, so it's it's not polarized it's much more like pyramidal and they do very little very I'm high sorry, can we just can we just right. step back a little bit so for those that aren't familiar with the you know the polarized and the pyramid pyramidal and do you want to just break that down a little bit just to um, yeah so well the definition of polarized is that you've you've basically got a, a whole load of work at a low intensity and then you've got a smaller amount of work at a very high intensity and very little in this kind of middle zone um and so that's been proposed you know promoted quite a bit as the optimal training i've i see no evidence to support that actually i mean it might have a, a role at certain times of the year and maybe if you're a middle distance runner i could see that you know where you don't need to do tempo or threshold running if you're an 800 meter runner you do some longer slower easier running to develop your aerobic system and you do some you know really high quality race pace stuff if you're a 5k 10k half or full marathon runner then that stuff in the middle, that tempo threshold thing, close to the races, the speeds at which you intend to race, race speed, exactly. Why would you avoid that? Yeah, yeah, precisely. So, so that becomes more pyramidal, where you've got, you still got most of your work down here, but you've got quite a lot of work in that middle bit. You've got very little at the at the, at the sharp end. You don't need to be doing those, you know, high intensity interval training if you're a marathon runner, particularly. So, it's that. Um, so that's what I would call pyramidal training and, and that's what we see the kenyans and ethiopians typically do okay so you, you wouldn't be going for the 80 20 sort of thing you'd be what would no you and the thing about eight, so the other confusion here is that 80 20 and polarized seem to be kind of th thought of as being polarized uh, as being synonymous and um and i'm not sure that they are necessarily because you could I mean, where do you draw the line between the 80 and the 20 anyway that's that's never been clear to me <laughs> you know um where does the 80 end and the 20 begin and you could do if it's if it's at lactate turn point or critical speed you could do 20 percent above it and 80 percent below that doesn't make it polarized you see what i mean because you could still yeah. be doing stuff around. so there's a whole bunch of confusion yeah. the around that thing is the other confusing thing is if, if you're not actually training that much then then you know you do 20 percent at a high intensity and 80 percent easy you're not actually doing much at a high intensity at all yeah. and if you're doing as you say if you're doing 100 and 60 k's a week or 200 k's a week or whatever and yeah, you're yeah. doing 20 percent of it you know if you were doing polarized or 80 20 um that's that's a lot of high intensity mm. stuff you know so it's it, it can get a bit sort of confusing <laughs> yeah as um, i said it depends where you draw the line between the it, i think to make it dichotomous like that is is wrong anyway okay because training intensities and durations are a continuum in any case so to artificially draw a line and go to 80 20 or 90 10 or whatever it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me and especially if you're as you said if you're kind of leaving out the speed that you race at <laughs> yeah i mean that's madness isn't it that's and they, they certainly don't they don't do that and you know why why would you really you don't want to be running at that speed all the time because it would be very fatiguing but it's got to be a you know a really fundamental element of the weekly plan to do at least some training at that speed you know, you mentioned Derek Clayton. So I, I don't know if it's true. I've actually met him a couple of times, but, um, you know, he, he ran 2.833 in like 1969, I think it was. Just just ridiculous. He broke the, the world best by two minutes. And apparently he ran, yeah, ran did all his running at um, the marathon's pace. Yeah. <laughs> and had an operation. Well, actually, but, you know, the, the frank, Arthur Lydiard is obviously a bit of a guru, isn't he, in the, in the running world. And again, his... Um, 
his work or his prescriptions have been misinterpreted, I think, as well. People talk about it as 100 miles a week sort of thing. And therefore, the assumption is that it's 100 miles of slow running. But it really isn't. If you look at the paces he was prescribing, it was 100 miles of pretty hard running some of the time. Yeah, some of it was easy, but a lot of it was steady and a fair bit of it was tempo. So it's not, you don't just jog around and expect to be an elite marathon runner. Well, you know, I, I, obviously you've got to scale it. You have to have some recovery, but you don't want to be training hard all the time because when you do your track sessions, when you do your 15 by a kilometer or your 30 by a minute, you want to be able to hit them hard. So you've got to have a bit of a hard, easy approach to things as well. well wasn't Arthur Lydia, but, he's the New Zealand trainer from, from way back. People don't know him, but wasn't he training Peter Snell? And, yeah. you know, Peter Snell was on the 800 and 1500, the, you know, the Olympics. So I don't think you could do that just doing long, slow distance. <laughs> no. No, so and yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think runners spend a lot of time. We we spent. I know you spoke to Marty Caballa this this morning, and um, you you can design umpteen different types of interval training program. And there's a lot to be said for doing interval training. You know, whether you're an athlete or a regular uh, regular person, you can get a lot of bang for your buck from so doing it. But if you're a runner, you spend probably ninety percent of your time not doing intermittent exercise, but doing continuous running. So actually regulating the speed at which you do those continuous runs is really important. And you don't, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get the physiological adaptation that you want if you run too many miles at too low an intensity. I think, you know, you've got to get the right distance, the right volume, the event that you're training for and for your own present Makes qualities. Sense. Physiologically, it makes sense, right? You want, want to have your heart rate going at, at a speed yeah. of sort of, you want to have your oxygen consumption, you know, going through the muscle, the mitochondrial mm -hmm. function, the nitric oxide production, whatever it is, you know, calcium release, AMPK yeah. activation. You want to actually have that, you know, just like anything. You train, you know, it's, it's specificity, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it goes back to specificity. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we mentioned Paula Radcliffe, but her training was, was absolutely not, polarized and, and I've, I've read that her training was polarized it absolutely wasn't she used to she didn't really run very easily very often at all she she was one of these people who just liked to push on she liked running fast and um you know she built up in mileage over the years and very few of them were run at slower than say six minute mile pace and quite often quite close to five minute you know even when she's doing a steady run she's moving along pretty briskly doesn't mean to say that um you, you know that you know she's not above her lactate turn point or anything like that but she's she's running at a high quality but and she put quality before quantity and not everybody's made up that way and, and actually you know when it comes to working with sports scientists actually having heart rate zones and you know for these different tracks and actually slowing some athletes down on occasion such that they can get more benefit from the high intensity is, is great don't get me wrong I, I think you've got to get that balance but certainly the one of the keys to her success was not running jogging around it was actually whenever she went out for a continuous run she'd not she'd go in a good lick yeah yeah okay just just thinking about starting to think about wrapping it up here um which is it's been great i've really enjoyed it but one thing i just wanted to talk about a little bit was was vo to max which we touched on a lot of people think tend to think i don't know maybe more than lay the people that haven't studied it that much that vo to max is the be all and end all but i remember um, a paper from, from years ago, it was Shogard, 1986, I think, showed Tour de France cyclists over a season, their VO2 max did not change, but their performance and their muscle mitochondrial function, their citrate synthase and things changed 200 or 300%. So I just thought that was something, and I'm sure you've seen that along the way as well. You don't actually need that much training. Well, as you said, the, 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 the distance runners that you looked at are always training pretty decently, but you don't have to do that much to actually maintain your cardiac output, your AVO2 difference, et cetera, to maintain the VO2 max, but your performance and your lactate threshold and things would, would change a lot with training. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah, yeah, it is. And certainly, yeah, your, your lactate profile is, is sensitive to training and your oxygen cost is, at least for running as well. And I think it's because you do enough running and your biomechanics basically changes to make running at that speed more efficient over time. That's really what happens. Um, I, I, I know the paper you're talking about. The example I can give is I did a um, case study on Paula Radcliffe where I show her, her VO2 max, her running economy, her lactate profiles over, it's about a 15 year period, I think. Um, but her VO2 max is basically exactly the same. A little bit of fluctuation, but from the age of about 18 to beyond the time where she sets the world record, it doesn't really change. And yet her performance is going through the roof. Mm -hmm. And if you look at her running economy, it gets better and better and better year by year by year. 
And that means, of course, that when she's running at a particular, say, lactate value, she's able to operate at a much higher speed. So lactate threshold naturally shifts to the right and so on. So, so for sure, I mean, it doesn't mean to say that if you want to be Elliot Kipchoge, you can do it off a VO2 max of 50. <laughs> so, you know, it has to be a bit of a certain threshold. Otherwise, yeah. it makes the values you'd need for running economy and lactate threshold to be impossible. So, you know, it has to yes. you'd need 70 plus or exactly that was my feeling i did my master's with, masters with david costal and he used to always say you need 70 mils per kilo and then you can do whatever but it, but it doesn't mean like if you're 70 75 78 80 it's not necessarily going to discriminate but you need to kind of have 70 to to, to do it so just again with yeah. the economy we've sort of come and gone with the economy just to, just to try and get it in my head how do you how do you think that the economy is improved by distance running because i know Having slow twitch muscle fibers is important, but that's not really going to change. You think it's the biomechanics? No? I think it must. I think it must be because when you do the um, you know the comparisons of elite cyclists and recreational cyclists, the oxygen cost mils mils per uh, mil, mils per minute per watt you know is basically the same. So being a really well trained cyclist doesn't seem to change your efficiency any. Um, and so if it was anything to do with muscle oxidative capacity or fiber type, you know, then you'd perhaps start to see that and you don't. But with running, it's absolutely the case. You know, it's not just the Radcliffe case studies. There's other things that show that elite runners are more economical than less elite runners. And if you train, you do the longitudinal studies, you can find that, you know, it's not. Well, you can get some short term changes if you've got people who aren't, uh, haven't done much running in the first place. If you become an elite runner, then you have to maintain it. But, you know, it's probably why you can still perform really well into your thirties and even forties. Cause even if your VO2 max is just starting to fall away a little bit, you can more than compensate by getting more, more efficient, more economical. And, I, and, and the fact that there's no difference in cycling, but there is a difference in running, you know, the physiology ought to be pretty much the same. The, the biomechanics in cycling are, are much more similar, aren't they? Compared, you, you only have to watch different people run along the street. <laughs> it's pretty ugly. It's often and it's pretty, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that's what happens is that you just things smooth out, you know, that you, any kind of vertical oscillation that you had over time, any wild arm action that yeah, it just all becomes tighter yeah. with time. I think you probably become stiffer. There's there's an argument for that as well. And you don't lose so much energy to the environment. You get a stretch shortening cycle happening as well. There's a whole bunch of things, but I think it's mainly a biomechanical change. Wow. Okay. Well, this has been really, really interesting for me and I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. So is there anything else you wanted to, to bring up or I think we'll uh, wrap it up? No? no, I don't think so. I think it was a pretty wide ranging, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. All right. So thank you very much. And uh, if people wanted to get in contact with you, are you okay if they uh, contact you on Twitter or something like that? Yeah. What is your Twitter? Hello. What is your Twitter uh, address? At, at Andy Beatridge. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so they can find me on there or I think well, my email's run easy that's to find That's a good well. little thing. Yeah, we touched on um, nitrate earlier that I could almost have you, I'm, you're a busy man, but I could almost have you back if you're open to it to talk about nitrate. Yeah, we'll do that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. get pulled in all sorts of different directions, but it's all, always fun. Okay, good on you. Thanks a lot. See you, mate. Cheers, Glenn. Bye. Bye.